of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever a name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you holy holy there is no one Good morning, everybody. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's so good that we can gather online, although apart, but together. Before we go into a time of worship this morning and response, we're going to use some songs that most of us should know. I want to invite us to, to lean into today, everything that God has for us today. These are times where we would love to be together physically and we're going to be doing that soon. As I announced last Sunday, this coming Sunday morning we are calling Zoom Sunday. And so if you haven't yet, I want to invite you to go and get the Zoom app for your mobile device or for your computer. The download link is available on the bottom of the screen now. Figure it out, it's super easy. Our kids have been using it for school. We use it for a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one and small group interactions. And we are wanting next Sunday at nine o'clock to all be together on the screen, to wave, to say hi, but we're gonna use that Sunday to announce our first physical test gathering Sunday. And so go and get the Zoom app. Next week, nine o'clock is Zoom Sunday. We're going to have a time of offering and Kim will lead us in that. 
We're going to have my dad Graham bringing the word to us in a little while's time, and I'm so excited for that. Let's let's let the truth of God's word really just so saturate our hearts and give us a fresh desire to love Jesus and serve Him more. That's our prayer for you, church. Our prayer is that you would know all that God has called you for, even during this time of how to use your gifts, how to serve others, how to magnify God through your work, your place of education, wherever you might be, that you would be mobilized to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. And so as we get into it this morning, we're going to have a small, short greeting from a friend of mine, Etienne. He and his wife, Beth, lead a church in East London. And so I've invited him to just send a, a greeting for us. And he's going to just do that, which will then just lead us into a time of music, singing, and response together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for all that you have in store for us today. We thank you for families that are gathering, kids that are gathering, uh, young and old that are gathering. God, sharing screens, sitting on the couch, uh, watching this right now. God, wherever they might be, together we pray that you would have your way amongst us. Move in your power, God. Draw us back to yourself, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Etienne. Hi, friends. Etienne here. The letter of, the, of James in the New Testament begins with a very simple greeting and then this cracker piece of advice. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Imagine you met Nelson Mandela or Mother Teresa and they said to you, Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Well, then you'd know you can pay attention to them, whether you like the advice or not. I'll, I want to suggest that James can write these words to the early church because he's earned the right to do so. I take this James to be James, the brother of our Lord Jesus, not one of the 12 disciples originally, but later after Jesus' death and resurrection, he became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. In the years that follow, he experienced a tremendous amount of suffering and turmoil in that city. James was eventually killed around AD 63 by a mob action in the city. My point is just, James writes about facing up to perils and he has the authority to speak about it, which makes his advice even more irritatingly relevant. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. I don't have much time to unpack his reasons except to point out that trials are always an opportunity for us to discover who or what we are really trusting in. I think that James believes that we can rejoice in the midst of trials, not because we like them, not because trials are from God or something like that, but because if your faith is in God, then what's really being tested is not just your faith, but God's faithfulness. And James is convinced that you will discover that the faithfulness of God can withstand any trial. May you and I continue to add our voices to this chorus. God bless you. I 
worship you. You are we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are we make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
Good morning, church. As part of our worship this morning, we're going to be giving to God. And there's much discussion on this topic. But I want to share a very brief message with you. And my question to you is, why give? You see, giving shows that He is Lord of our lives. First and foremost, God wants us to give because it shows that we recognize that He is truly Lord of our lives. And in James chapter 1 verse 17, it says, Every good and perfect gift is from above. Friends, every good and perfect gift is from God. Everything we own, everything we have, in fact, everything we are, comes from God. And when we give, we simply give a portion of the abundance that He has given us back to Him. Giving is an expression of our thankfulness and praise to God. And it comes from a heart of worship. That's why at Glen Eden we like to give during worship. And I just trust that as we give, you might be giving a little bit later on, maybe through the week, by means of EFT, whichever way you decide. I trust that you would truly recognize that He is Lord of your life. That He is Lord of my life. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. We declare that you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father, this morning, I thank you for each person that gives. Father, I pray that you would bless them indeed. And Lord, I pray that you would use this for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Hi, Glen Eden family. Hi, John and Nola here from Sinsa West. We greet all our lovely friends there at, uh, at uh, Glen Eden on this beautiful winter's day. And uh, we must say we are missing your company. And I particularly, as a greeter at the front of the church, I'm missing all those wonderful hugs every Sunday morning. And I'm looking forward to the time when we'll be together again so that uh, Wendy and I can we welcome you all back to our lovely church. Have a wonderful day. God bless you all. Amen. We are very grateful for all of God's blessings to us while we've been in lockdown and living in this different way of life. And it's been good to keep in touch with some of you. And we send love to all. Bye. I want to thank God for His faithfulness, His truth, His help in times of need, that He is just amazing. We've had a lot of orders for funeral flowers, um, and it's difficult to get flowers, and God has provided in such an amazing way, flowers which we normally don't have this time of year because of the pruning. And as we were, these orders were coming in, and we were putting them together, and I was amazed at what we were picking, this little voice said to me, you should put your prices up. If the flowers are expensive, everybody's battling to get flowers. And I thought, yeah, maybe I should. And then I can just make some more money. And I just heard the Holy Spirit say, God does not like dishonest measure. And that you would be taking advantage because of the, the difficult situation. And the Lord said, I will provide all you need. I want you to trust in me and I want you to do what I say. And I just had such a sense of peace. God has been amazing already. I don't need to make my own plan. Just to trust in Him and know He's working things out. Thank you, Lord. Bye, everyone. Good morning. Today's reading is taken from Philippians 3, verse 13 to 16. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal 
for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true what we have attained. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day. Thank you that we can gather around your word once again. We pray that you would guide Graham in heaven, bringing your message to us this morning. And we pray that you would prepare our minds and our hearts. We just rejoice in you this morning, Lord, and we bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lauren, for doing the reading for us. These times together are very special, apart yet together. And again this morning as we continue in Philippians, as we pick up Paul's heartbeat and his passion that we've been sharing with you over these Sundays, trusting that something of what he felt and exposed us to becomes our very own thing. And so this morning we are going to focus on verses 13 and 14, and if I might just draw your attention to them again, Paul writes and he says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press towards the goal of, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so this morning, I want to pick up some of the phrases that Paul uses and explain some of the words to bring a word, a message, an encouragement, a challenge to each one of us this morning. You see, Paul seems to summarize everything that he's been saying up until this point with these words, this one thing, this one thing. I want to speak to you this morning about being a one thing Christ follower. I've noticed in my years in the ministry that there is a connection between the a low level or high level of satisfaction in being a Christian connected to whether a person has been able to sort out the priorities in terms of their Christian life and their following of Christ. What I've discovered is that people who kind of shift from one leg to the other haven't quite made up their mind to dabbling in a little bit of this, a little bit of that, trying to fit church in, trying to fit God into their lives, trying to be a committed Christian uh, for part of the week. Those are usually the people who never really come to a full appreciation and experience and understanding of the tremendous joy of all that God intends for them to have in knowing him personally. And whereas those who've made up their mind, who are single-minded in their commitment to Christ, those are the ones who seem to have sorted out a whole lot of issues within their lives. And that single-mindedness in following Christ has impacted upon everything that they are in terms of their family life, their home life, being a husband, being a father, being out there in the commercial world, socializing, you see that single-mindedness of having made up your mind, like Paul says, this one thing. I've boiled everything down to just this one thing. And that's what we're going to have a look at this morning. Single-mindedness is a most commendable characteristic and quality of life. That single-mindedness is brought to bear and influences just about every aspect of our lives in terms of our vocation, sport, things that we are doing. We commit ourselves to something in such a way that we're really saying, I'm not going to let anything distract me from the thing and the goal that I have before me, whatever that goal is. And single-mindedness is the ability to find the main thing and to remain undistracted and totally committed to pursue to the finishing line the thing that I have set my heart on. Scripture addresses single-mindedness in a number of different ways and through a number of different people. It was Joshua who challenged the people at the end of his life 
to choose this day who you will serve. If God be God, then serve him. If Baal be Baal, serve him. Because he sensed even within the people as they moved into the promised land and the promises of God that they they were undecided. Do we live flat out for God or, or do we do a bit of this and a bit of that? And then he goes on and not only challenges, but he makes a declaration and he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There's a single mindedness in his leadership of his family, of his life. There was something that that his family could gauge, they could observe and they say, this is what dad, this is what grandfather is doing, that he is determined as for me and my whole house. We buy into this single mindedness that we are absolutely, totally committed as Paul was declaring it in those words in verse 13. Elijah asks the nation of Israel this question. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? And he too was aware of the fact that there is a people that God has called out who bear his name. And he senses as he observes them this kind of shift you know, from one leg to the other and in the process, never really making the progress that God intended them to have and to enjoy. And their double-mindedness causes them to limp in their whole progress of their Christian life. Jesus points out in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24 that no one can serve two masters. It's going to bring conflict into your life. For he said, he will hate the one and love the other. He will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then when Martha comes to him complaining about her sister not assisting in the chores of that particular day, Jesus points out to Martha, he says, there's only one thing that is needful. And what he's really saying is at this point in time, I'm available, I'm here. Mary has decided what is the priority. And with a single mindedness, she has decided she does not want to let anything else distract her in that she has chosen the thing that is most uh, needed at this particular time. There's just one thing that is needed, Jesus is saying to Martha. James makes it very clear when he says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And he uses that word again later on in chapter 4 and verse 18. uh, Verse 8, he says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. That word double-minded that he uses is kind of speaking of a schizophrenia. It's a word that means you've got two souls. And the soul is that part of us that thinks, reasons, feels and decides. And he is saying that you're living as if you've got these, these two schizophrenic portions to you. In the one way you think like this, feel like this, and decide like that, and in another time you think like this, feel like this, and decide, and you kind of, there's a dichotomy in your decision making, and that is going to produce an instability within your life. You're going to be unstable in everything that you do. God's word further exhorts us, for instance, in Colossians chapter 3, if you be raised with Christ, and, and that is the state and the condition of every child of God, If you be raised with Christ, set your mind on things above, not on things on this earth. Jesus reminds in the Sermon on the Mount to seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. And again, Hebrews writer in chapter 12 says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so there's this exhortation and the word that the writer to the Hebrew Uh, users is saying I turn away from everything else that might distract me and I focus on him that is the word that he uses this is where Paul is at in this particular portion chapter 3 and verse 13 he says "I, I haven't yet got there but this one thing I do and it seems as if Paul recognizes that this is relational That the relationship that is important to me is my relationship with Christ. It's not about projects. It's not about doing things as such. The first thing is Jesus. I want to know him. The power of his resurrection 
And I want to go even further than that, as we heard in an earlier Sunday, to be acquainted with his suffering. And this one thing, it's a relational thing with Christ more than anything else. I want to be so intimately connected. There is the element of intimacy. But he also says that this is functional. It's about an activity in the light of my relationship with him. There are things that I'm going to do. There are things that I'm going to pursue. Well, what is this one thing that Paul is speaking about? The answer is found in verse 14. He says, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's a richness in the words that he uses when he says, I press on towards the goal. It's a word that describes an aggressive pursuit as a hunter pursuing his quarry. It's a chase after something. It's with haste. It's with determination. And that's the word when he says, I press on towards. He says, there's something so urgent, so passionate about my getting to know Christ that I'm going to do it with a diligence and with a determination. He says, I press on towards the goal. That word goal, skopos, from which we get scope, it describes a mark that is seen in the distance. There's something that I've seen that is out there. I've set my eyes on it. That's the mark that I'm heading for in the distance. That's what I'm aiming at. And this goal is the prize of the upward call of God that is in Christ Jesus. And the prize is is that which the athlete wins after the event, after they have, with every effort, crossed the finishing line and they've been awarded with the prize that is in Christ Jesus. And so Paul is responding to what he calls the upward call of God. And friends, what this is saying is that ours is a calling God. I've heard God calling me. There's there's something in this good news message. There's the voice of God, and it's an upward call, and this is what the work of, of Christ and the cross does. It lifts us up. It lifts us up constantly in, in many occasions when Jesus was dealing with people. He would tell them, get up. Get up. Take up your bed and walk, and it's an upward call. It's God calling us to get out of the pit, get out of the donga, get out of the rut, come up out of the valley, get away from the plateaus of your life and come up higher. And it seems that in the geography of many of the experiences of men in Old and New Testament, mountains were very significant. Mountains spoke in principle of getting away from that which is down there and coming up higher. And it is in those special times with God where even in the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, it is introduced by this uh, description. Jesus went up into the mountain and sat down and his disciples came to him. I just learned a beautiful description of a disciple from Craig Farrell listening to him preach that a disciple is an intentional learner. It's not a person who just learns by accident or haphazardly through life, but a disciple is one who set his mind with diligence to discover things that God wants him to know. And in that event of the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus goes up higher. He comes out of the villages, out of the cities, goes up into a mountain, And those who were determined, intentional to learn something from him, they came to him. It's an upward call. Friends, God is calling us upward. Get up. Get higher. Move onwards. This upward call of God is a call, we believe, to a single-mindedness. It's God calling us to, once we put our hands to the plow, not to look back. It is the upward call of God who calls us out of something into something upward and onward. It is the call of God that says, don't keep hankering after the past. Where some of them said, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me go back and do this and do that. People who had things that they felt they needed to do. And Paul is saying, no, it's this one thing. It's a one thing. 
There are some things that prevent us from living as one thing type of followers. May I just share three things with you before we close. There are three obstacles to being a one thing person. The first is an unhealthy view of our past or the past. Paul says forgetting what is behind me. And there's a whole lot of things for Paul and for you and for me that are behind us. They're not all evil. They're not all bad. Some of them are achievements. Many of them are accolades. Many are the um, commendations of people. Well done, you've done this in the past. But there also there's pain and there's some of the things that are actually atrocities of our past. Whatever makes up our past, Paul is saying that for me to move onwards, to lean into, to press on, to, to aggressively pursue what God is calling me into in my Christian life, I've got to forget the past. And that is not to disregard my heritage or my background at all, but it is not to make the mistakes of hanging on to the past as many of us do. Just not being able to let go of a thing. Where the pain, the memory, the injustice, the, the thing that, that wounded me and scarred me. I just can't let go of that. He said, he did, she did. And not being able to let go of the past. Paul said, I've got to forget that. I've got to move on. It's often living in the past. You know, this is what I used to be. But now things are all different. I mean, especially with the COVID-19 situation that we have. We hanker after things in the past. Things aren't going to be like that. We've got to move on uh, if we want to press into the things of God. Some people live with a fear of the past, things that they've done, things that might catch up with them. Paul says, forget the past, move on. And then some of us do what we do. We speak about the good old days. We long for the past. We just want something to be as it used to be. And God is saying, now I've got something so special for you. Move on. In my counseling of, of people often, I sit and I hear the stories of painful pasts, of abuse, of a woundedness, of things that were done to people when they were children or teenagers. And things that were sometimes blocked out and Forgotten, and now they emerge and they are brought back to the surface to muddy the present situation and fog up the future. And people grapple with things that happened in the past. And often I say to them, and I try not to sound unloving, as I would say to you this morning, I'm so sorry about the things that have happened to you in your past, your history. But friends, we can't change that. We can't turn back the clock. We can't undo that. It's happened. And here we are in the present with a God who says, come, I've called you up out of your past. Let go of that. And I, I have to say on occasions to people, it's time for you to let go of that now. It's time for you to forget the past in the way that it is harming and hurting and hindering you. It's time for you to move on. If you want to lean into and experience the things that God is calling you upward into. An unhealthy view of the past will be an obstacle for you and for me moving forward. The second obstacle is an undeveloped view or an understanding of the present situation. You see, we often want to tick a few boxes. You know, I've given my life to Christ there. I'm a Christian. I've got a Bible. I belong to a church and that's that. And Paul is saying, no, I haven't yet got it all. There's still so much more. And because there's so much more, this is why this one thing I do, I'm pressing on. Consider the postage stamp. Its effectiveness is in its ability to stick to one thing until it arrives. And this is what Paul is doing. And he's made up his mind, as Joshua did, as Elijah was challenging the people. As Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. I've made up my mind. I've got an amazing view. I've caught a glimpse of what God has in store for me. But I haven't got there yet. 
And so my present situation is this. I'm not what I used to be. But I'm not what I'm going to be. And I've got this healthy view of my present situation. There is so much more. Third obstacle that often present, prevents people from moving on and pressing on is an unfocused view of what lies ahead. You see, when Paul said, I press on to the mark and the goal of the calling of God, he said, I've seen something, I've caught a glimpse of it, as Christian did in Pilgrim's Progress. He saw the celestial city in the distance, and he said, that's my goal. Because I'm raised with Christ, I'm setting my heart on things that are above and we often get so distracted by all the things that are around about us, appealing to us, tantalizing us, tempting us, that we lose the conscious view that this earth is not our home. This is not the end product. But God has got something so more. And that clear view, that focused view of the future, causes me to say this one thing that I will do. Well, the single-mindedness, just before we apply this all, what it doesn't mean is this. To be single-minded in our commitment in following Christ does not mean that I neglect or abandon my other responsibilities while living here in the natural world. It does not mean that I become so heavenly-minded as the cliche goes, that I'm no, of no earthly use. But you see that when I'm living as a this one thing person, that single-mindedness, it flavors my conversation, my conduct. It governs my aspirations, my goals. It affects how I live as a family member, as a husband, as a father as an employee, as an employer. It affects my social life that I'm so focused on Jesus. I don't neglect those things. But this focus on Christ enriches conversation, conduct, relationships. It tempers my natural sinfulness and my, it shapes my character into Christ-likeness because I'm focused absolutely on him. And friends, as I close this morning, I want to urge you to pick up Paul's determined heartbeat and to become a this one thing person. You know, we often speak about people in derogatory ways, critical ways, and we try and sanitize that type of con destructive conversation by saying, well, at least one can say one thing about him. And we hope that that kind of removes all the other critical things that we've made. We need to become known as men and women, young people, young adults, boys and girls. And when people sum up our lives, they will automatically say, it's absolutely obvious that that person lives totally for Christ. Every decision they make is tempered by what he wants, his lordship, his kingship over my life. And it's such a pleasure to be with him because of his focus on Christ there's something enriching. I want to challenge you this morning. Put aside that temptation, that tendency that many of us have to try a little bit of this, and try a little bit of that, keep our options open. We want to see what's happening over here, see what's happening over there, who says what, what is he doing? And come to the place where your focus is totally on Christ because you see when we say with Paul, this one thing I do, I press on to the goal to receive the prize of the upward calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We discover that Christ's priorities become ours. The things that he is passionate about becomes our passion as well. His emphasis on people, the neighborhood, community, the church, stewardship, they become our heartbeat as well, all because we are focusing on him. And so we don't dabble here, we visit there, keep our options open, try this, try that. We focused on him. This means that my single-mindedness, my pursuit of 
all that Christ is, my relationship and intimacy will drive my purpose, my function, to the point that I do be, begin to reflect his character within my life. My experience, as I started off saying, has been that the people that I've encountered in my life who are most satisfied and most fulfilled are those who have said it's all about knowing him. Those who have a little bit of him, a little bit of that opinion, a little bit of that, are the ones who struggle, disillusioned, discouraged, never really making the progress God intended them to make. And I want to challenge you this morning to use this opportunity as I felt in my preparation that here is an opportunity for all of us to make a fresh commitment to this one thing. And so even now the Holy Spirit will show you there's a whole list that you have. You see, we will speak of multitasking. Paul speaks about this one thing. We speak of having a to-do list. Paul speaks of this one thing. We speak about a wish list. Paul speaks about this one thing. We speak about a bucket list before we kick it at the end of our lives. Paul speaks about this one thing. I feel that there's a God who stands before us in the room where we are listening and he says, I long for you to be single-minded in your pursuit after me and the things that are important to me. Friend, I, I want to suggest this morning, let's make a fresh commitment to him. I'm going to pray in a few moments. This isn't that time when you start gearing down, switching off and uh, getting up. But these are important, closing, responsive moments to a word, to an invitation, an upward call of God who says, come, get out of that pit now. Get out of that thing that you are in and you're lying in. Get out of that mess Get out of that condition. I'm calling you upward to embrace a one thing, to set your mark and your mind on the things of God. And make a commitment this morning. There's a song that we are going to use in these closing moments. And, and please stay right to the end. And the hymn writer wrote these words, and this is the thing that we embrace this morning in application of this message. Just as I am without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. It's an upward call. O Lamb of God, I come. God is so loving, so patient, so gracious. All the months, the weeks, the years that we've wasted with a little bit of this, a little bit of that, we've got off track. He says, come back this morning. Use this morning Use the moments of the song, the words of the song, the music in a tender-hearted way to say, Lord, I come back to you this morning. And with your grace, I want to be a one thing Christ follower. I want to set my eyes on you and I make a fresh commitment. Will you do that this morning? We pray briefly and that prayer will lead us into a few moments as we listen to the words and make them our own as we come to him just as I am. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the way you are so patient with us. Thank you for another opportunity this morning, another exhortation, another invitation of an upward call this morning to make a fresh commitment, to stop being lukewarm, to halting between two decisions, to saying, as for me, and my house, we will serve the Lord. Those who are making that fresh commitment this morning, let there be a wonderful transaction that takes place where the things that have hindered and hurt them are removed. There's a healing, there's a restoration, there's a binding up of brokenness. There's a fresh sense of your love and your presence this morning. There's a hope, there's an inward impartation of strength there's an awareness of your nearness. Bless us all as we come to that place of being able to say this one thing I do. We ask this for your honor and for your glory. 
and as we come just as we are. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, and we Just as I am